And, you know, we're in a new series. It's called Good Kings, Bad Kings. And and maybe you've never opened a Bible before. That's okay, because I want to help explain the basics of the beginning of the Bible to you. Because the Bible talks about kings, and I want us to help learn this morning how Israel got to the point of having a king. And and then we're going to be able to talk a little bit more about how in our own lives, we struggle, like, just like the people in the Bible struggled, with how do I live my faith? How do I keep my eyes fixed on God? How, how do I do this whole Christian walk thing? And, and this morning is an opportunity, if you don't know anything about the Bible, maybe you studied the Bible your whole life, I think we're going to all benefit from this as we look at the good kings of Israel and we also look at the bad kings of Israel. You know, fact, actually, one of the reasons we know that the Bible is true, for me it makes sense, and I'll present it to you. The Bible is a book that shares life as it is. It doesn't whitewash life. It doesn't leave people looking rosy and shiny and perfect. It talks about their imperfections and their flaws and their brokenness. And that's something at Thrive Church we say that we are imperfect people being changed by God. That's one of the things that we talk about because just like the Bible talks about broken people, it shows how God did a work in their lives. We believe God does a work in our lives to change us to be more like him. So where we're going over the next 30 minutes or less is just taking a look at Genesis to 1 Samuel, eight books of the Bible. And if you're here and you've never opened God's word before, take heart. You're going to walk away having learned something about God and you're going to understand what he wants you to know according to his word. Well, to link it to the Bible, we'll use a more common illustration rather than going back to 1500 BC. Let's just go back to 17, oh, I gave a hint, 1783. Who, who said this line? Now, th- those of you that are Jeopardy gurus, don't shout it out. Let the normal people have a chance to think, okay? Just raise your hand when you know the answer. How about that? That'll give you your area. Who said, I didn't fight George III to become George I? Raise your hand when you think you know the answer. Raise your hand now. The rest of us, non-Jeopardy gurus, right, the normal folk here, I'm going to give you a hint. All right, remember, raise your hand when you know the answer. There's a hint. Are we helping? How are we doing? Still struggling? Still? That's okay. That's okay. Well, the answer is George Washington. George Washington said that quote, and so here's a bit of history. Here in 1783, after leading the American colonies to victory over the who? All right, we got a little louder. The who? The British, right? He led the victory against the British. George Washington, many Americans viewed him as a savior. And historians say this, that they saw him as their savior and they wanted to make him king. They wanted him to become King Washington of the American empire. And George's response is like, I did not just fight George III to become George I. Do you see that? Do you see that? And so he recognized the danger of rushing to put a person in charge of a nation saying, you become the king, you do all the work, you fight our battles, you be victorious, we'll just let you handle that. How's that sound, right? And George Washington's like, no, no, that's not what I came to do. Now, now kind of building off that idea, right? Building off that parallel, we're gonna move forward or actually backwards in time into the Old Testament. And we're gonna see that throughout history, People have often sought visible, tangible leadership to solve their problems and to provide security. You know, we we lean on somebody else. Can you fix the problem for me? Can can you take care of this? We don't know how to fix it. We're just going to ask you to do it. You become our leader, and then you you assume the problem, right? It's now your problem, not my problem anymore. And that's kind of how humans have worked throughout history. And it's like, who wants to fix this mess? Okay, you get to be in charge of this mess. And in Israel and in the Old Testament, we're going to see that people shifted their focus. This is key. Catch this. They shifted their focus from being on God, and they looked to human leaders to be the people that would fix the problems. They, 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 they were setting themselves up for disappointment and spiritual drift. We take our eyes off of Jesus. You know, maybe your, your, your baseball coach says, keep your eye on the ball if you want to hit it, right? You take your eye off the ball, you're going to miss, right? And when they took their eyes off of God, they set themselves up for a miss. 
So if you've never opened God's word before, maybe just a little bit, maybe back in Sunday school when you were a child, we're going to refresh that and we're going to help give you an overview. From Genesis to 1 Samuel, that's one of the books in the Bible, 1 Samuel, about this portion of your Bible, it's summarized in this way. Genesis stands for the beginning. God creates. He speaks into existence everything. He creates from nothing. He breathes life into, into dry ground that he shaped into Adam, and, and he created his creation perfect and wonderful. And then his perfect, wonderful creation stumbled and sinned, and they fell away from a relationship with their creator where God, a holy God, a perfect God, cannot have sin in his presence. So therefore, he, he couldn't walk with his creation. He couldn't talk with his creation. There was a, a, a break in the relationship. Twelve chapters into Genesis, he picks one person named Abram. He changes his name later to Abraham. And, and that Abram, he gives a promise. If you trust me, if you follow me, if you have faith in me, I'm going to lead you to a promised land. I'm going to make your name great. Your descendants will outnumber the sand on the sea and the stars in the sky, and you will become a great nation. That was God's promise to one person. Trust me and look what I can do for you. And so that one person, Abram, starts following God, changes his name to Abraham. He's married to his wife, Sarah. Trouble is, they're in their 80s, and they don't have kids yet. Now, it doesn't take, you know, most people that don't watch Jeopardy might know you're not having kids if you're in your 80s, right? Like, just, we kind of know that. And so God's like, trust me, I'll take care of this. And then, like, in their 90s, they give birth to one child, Isaac. And that one child, the promise, the blessing, follows Isaac. And then Isaac has kids, and his kids have kids. And, and God's moving and working in this family, saying, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will protect you. I will provide for you. They go to Egypt, about 70 people. 400 years later, they come out over a million people. Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and, and Pharaoh sends the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And they wander for 40 years in the wilderness. And they learn to trust God and not doubt God. And they learn to have to rely upon God. And then God leads them to the promised land. Had they obeyed God, it would have taken two weeks to walk from Egypt to Israel. But instead of their disbelief, they had 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They get to the promised land. And God defeats nation after nation. They were kind of a city nation, city kingdom, like the king of Dover, the king of Manchester, the, the king of Red Lion. And they, they come into the area and they defeat the different cities and the different kings, God giving them the victory to the point they didn't even have to fight sometimes. He's like, trust me, I'll take care of you. They march around a huge city called Jericho seven times for seven days. They march around it seven times on the seventh day. They shout and blow trumpets and the walls fall down because God made it happen. God said, trust me, I'll take care of you. Believe and follow, have faith, I'll take care of you. I am your God, you are my people, and I will make you a great nation. Sets him up to this point. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God's declaring to the nation, he's speaking through Moses, through his mouthpiece. That's how he would speak through his representation, his prophet. And this is what he says to Israel. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commands... Ready? If you do this, you stay focused on this, you listen to me and you follow me, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. God's nation, Israel, promised Old Testament, if you trust and follow and believe and have faith, I will set you high above all the nations because God is their leader. God is the one providing and protecting. The unseen one is the one that they're looking to and following. He then follows this up a couple verses later in Deuteronomy 28, 15. He says, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all of his commands and decrees, all of these curses will come on you and overtake you. So Israel's given a choice, trust and follow and believe high above all the nations. Don't trust, don't follow, don't believe, step out of his blessing. That's what sin does in our lives. When we don't do what God asks us to do, we're stepping out of his protection and his blessing. There's characteristics and qualities of our life that God says, I can't bless that. You're doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, where you want to do it, how you want to do it. I can't bless that because you're not doing what I've asked you to do. God's promise to his people were, listen, keep your eyes on me. Don't drift. Don't lose your focus. I'll take care of you. And that's the promise that Israel got to see God make to them. And so we're, we're doing this overview from Genesis to 1 Samuel to get us to the point where God is saying, I am your unseen king. 
I am your unseen king. And there's actually a word for that. Again, if you've never opened your Bible, this is good. You're learning, right? You're learning. Israel was actually a theocracy. Maybe you haven't heard the word theocracy before, but theocracy means God led. God led. God was their king. God was their governmental system. God was how he, the one ruling over Israel. And so God took Israel. It was actually a small little nation. If you look at your geography maps, Israel is this tiny little country between three continents, between Africa, Asia, and Europe. And all the empires, the Egyptian empire, the Roman empire, the Assyrian empire, all the empires throughout history and throughout time that were trying to conquer the known world would have to walk through Israel. They would use it like a highway going north and south, going up and down from one continent to the other. I'm not a big Risk fan. Anybody play Risk? You love Risk. Like, the game is like, my brain might not be big enough to understand Risk. Like, you got to strategically place your armies, and you got to roll the dice, and you got to win, and then you're like, but you understand in Risk, there's a strategy. If you want to win the game of Risk, you got to have the, 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 the strategic points on the board. Israel was the strategic point. God put them there on purpose. He said, you trust me, I got your back. You follow me, I'm going to make you high above the other nations. You keep your eyes on me and you don't have spiritual drift in your life, you will be blessed. Problem is, we all drift. Problem is, we all have brokenness in us. Problem is, we all struggle. God's like, listen, I need you to, to treat me like the ultimate ruler. And that's what God asks in our lives today. Will you let God be your ultimate ruler? He says to Israel, my laws will govern all the aspects of your life. And today as Christ followers, we're looking at the Bible. Does the Bible speak to all the aspects of our life? Human leaders like judges and prophets throughout, they would speak up for God and say, this is the message of God and this is what God says. And that's how God would lead his people. And, and they didn't have the king sitting on a throne that they could go and see. They had to explain to these other nations, our nation of Israel is different than yours and yours and yours and yours because you have leaders and emperors and rulers and pharaohs and kings. We have the unseen one that created the world. Well, that's nice. They probably think Israel people are they're like, you guys are nuts. Like, like, what are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, but that's what faith is sometimes. Something that doesn't make sense. Something that doesn't, isn't easily understood. And so they looked at God and they said, God, we understand you're leading. It's your will. It's your nation. It's your doing. We follow you. We're blessed. We disobey. We step out of that blessing into a place where we feel punishment and hurt and pain because of it. Israel operates this way from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then we get to 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, Israel makes a request of God that it kind of offends both his prophet, his name was Samuel, who would speak for God, and it also offends God himself. You know what the question was they asked God? They said, God, we want a king. We want a king. Let, let me lead, read the passage to you this morning just to help give you some uh, filling in the blanks here. So Samuel, who was like the prophet, the main leader in Israel, would speak for God. When Samuel grew old, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abinadab, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, and they accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. So, so as we kind of put the detail out, like you recognize like Samuel, you're a good leader. But there's a problem. Your son's behind you. They're not good leaders. And in fact, they cheat people. They're messed up. They're broken. And we don't want to follow them. So instead of following your sons, we would rather have a king over us. Samuel felt a little offense to that. But, but it was also an offense to God. It was also an offense to God. Now, we have no idea of how Samuel parented his kids. It doesn't get into the details. But a detail that we can draw out of 1 and 2 Kings as we look at this series, and this is why I think the Old Testament is, is so great, because it connects us to the lives of the people that lived thousands of years ago, and the mistakes they make can be made today still. And the areas of obedience they make can still be made still. And, and this is one of the things to draw out of this. You know, sometimes, as, as Stephanie was up here asking for volunteers to help with Drive Kids, there's a reason behind that. Investing in kids is important. Investing in kids is important. I don't know what kind of father Samuel was. But, but 
this truth is drawn out. Dr. Randy Smith, a Bible scholar, said this, preoccupied parents produce unprepared kids. Can I say it again? Preoccupied parents produce unprepared kids. Samuel was a great leader. His two sons, not so great. And because of that, Israel's looking around like all these other nations around us, they don't have a prophet speaking for God. They, they have kings sitting on a throne and there's structure and there's order and the king is in charge and what he says goes. And that's kind of the situation that pops up here. That's what's going on. The Israelites, listen, the next slide on there, it says this, the Israelites feeling insecure among the neighboring nations demanded a king like all the other nations. 1 Samuel 8 <clears throat> verse 5 goes on to say this. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, they displeased Samuel. And he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people who are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected. <clears throat> it is me as their king they have rejected. And as they have done from day one, I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. <clears throat> you want to be the king? You want to have a king sit on a throne? You want to look like everybody else? You want to give up on the promise God saying, honor me and I will make you high above the nations? Here's what it's going to look like to have a king. Here's the warning that's given to them. And this warning goes out to Israel. He says, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He'll take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He'll take a tenth of your grain and of your uh, vintage and all that is to his, give it all to his officials and attendants. You yourselves will become his what? Slaves. I, I got to pause and say, what is it about the human nature? It says, hey, just come be our leader and be in charge of us and rule over us as a king and we'll be your slave. Like, like what would make you say, that's a good deal. I, I want to have somebody ruling over me and being in charge of me and I'll, I'll just go from being free and serving the unseen God to being a slave serving another human being over me. But that's where Israel was. Israel drifted away from where God wanted them to be. They were guilty. Catch this. Here's the point this morning. Israel was guilty of seeking human solutions to spiritual problems. God, we know spiritually we should trust you and follow you and you'll take care of us. You'll keep us safe and you'll put us high above all the other nations. We know you've done it all the way up until now, but now we're kind of tired of that. Now we're kind of like looking for something else. We want to be like everybody else. We want to have a king sitting in a room on a throne ruling us like all the other nations have. Now, now to help you understand some of the why this might have happened, you might not have studied biblical history before and dug in deep, but at some points, the king of one kingdom would fight the king of the other kingdom rather than having their armies fight. And if King A could beat King B, kingdom B would become his. And they're like, let's pick a warrior king. Let's pick someone who's got big muscles and veins popping out everywhere. Like the WWE guys that slam people and beat people up. Let's make that person our king. Because then he'll kick all the enemies around us. So he'll just defeat them in battle and then we don't have to fight. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be great? And they're like, let's have, let's have a king come and rule. Instead of having to pray to the unseen God, we can actually show people who's your king. Oh, look, here's his face. He's on our currency. Here, here's the coin with Caesar's picture. Here's, here's the king that we have. Rather than trying to explain to them that, well, we have an unseen God who created the universe, and, and we worship him, and he puts us far above all the other nations. And people are like, you're crazy. You're nuts. You're so strange. And so Israel was looking for a human solution to a spiritual problem, the fact that they didn't want to trust God the way that they were supposed to. They didn't want to trust God the way that they were supposed to. And when we shift our focus, just like Israel, from God to human leaders, we set ourselves up for disappointment and spiritual drift. Well, and I hope somebody else will solve the problem that I'm having, maybe in my marriage or with my kids or at work or frustration, or the pain, the grief, the, the things that unsettle me. I trust somebody else to do that work. Somebody else can take the pain. Somebody else can do the hard stuff I don't want to do. But when that happens, we, we drift away from God because we're using human solutions to spiritual problems. So thankfully, we have this whole series to walk through, and we get to see what kind of character and qualities good kings have. 
in First and Second Kings, two books of the Old Testament. We're going to see the name, the story, the example, and some of them are a king who did right in the eyes of the Lord. But then some of the bad kings, their lives are summarized up in this way. These kings did what was wicked or what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Their character and their qualities, God said, I can't bless. And in that, there's pain and hurt that comes into the story of Israel because they have the wrong leaders doing the wrong things. The purpose of this series that we're going to be walking through this next couple of weeks is to look character by character through the Old Testament in the book of First and Second Kings. You can come here not knowing anything about First and Second Kings. You're going to leave having learned about that person, learned about their story and their life, and how we can draw out truth for us to allow us to live our lives. We will ask questions like, are we living with the character that God blesses? Is that something in my life? Am I living with the character that God blesses? Or are we living with the sin that God condemns? And we can evaluate and say, God, is there spiritual drift in my life? Is my heart in tune to what you're asking? Am I following you and following your commands that you have so I can have the best life that I can? You might be sitting here and it's like, why do we study an Old Testament book, something that was written 3,000 years ago? Isn't that dusty history? Like, does it really matter today? Like, our lives are so different than the people in the Bible. Our lives are different in some aspects, but the human nature is still exactly the same. And that's why I love God's word, because I see in these stories, I see the struggle, I see the hurt, I see the wrestling, and I have those same things in my life. And I see God give spiritual solutions to the human problems, and I can see God do that same in my life today. We're studying these things because human nature hasn't changed, even though our technology has advanced greatly, and there's people watching on YouTube right now that you couldn't do that 10 years ago. You couldn't do that 1,000 years ago. Like Technology has changed, but the human conditions are still exactly the same. The principle of godly leadership and character are timeless. And maybe you have the, the privilege of being able to look back and somebody in your family tree, somebody in your history, like, I knew that person stood for God and did what was right and was a good person. There's timelessness in godly character and qualities. And I got to say this today. The reality is you are setting up your kids that are following you for the lives that will come with theirs. You can either be a stumbling block for your kids by, by messing up and struggling and being an example they shouldn't follow, or you can live as a shining light for your kids, saying, I want to show you what it looks like to be a person of faith who trusts, who believes, who follows. I want to show you the character and the qualities that God blesses. All of us have people following behind us. There's people you're influencing. In Israel, the king influenced the whole nation. One person sat in a point that influenced the whole nation, and we're going to see the devastation that comes when that one person influences them for evil. But we'll also see how God blesses some of the good kings that influence the whole nation for truth and for righteousness. God's standard for his people remained consistent. From Old Testament to today, God's standard for his people remains consistent. That's why the word of God is so true. It tells us the story throughout the timeline of history. And it shows us how God worked then and that same God works now. And we can learn and grow and recognize. We can learn and grow and recognize. See, just like they struggle with human solutions versus spiritual problems, we struggle today. A little bit different, but man, it's still the same. We have to examine our own character in light of scripture. What, what does God's word say? Does my life reflect that? Or does my life look way different than what God's word says? We have to gain insight from God's word to say, okay, what's God actually asking me to do? And that insight from God's word helps us recognize the things that we can shift and change. And that shift and change is known as being challenged to grow in your faith. At Thrive Church, we want to see everyone take the next step in their relationship with God. You might not even take in step one yet, like you're still watching, listening, and learning, and that is great. We want you here for that, to be able to ask questions and like, help me understand, what, what are we really talking about? Maybe you've taken one or two steps, but then you've stopped growing in your relationship with God. That's fine too. We want to help you figure out what does that next step look like to move forward. And we all move at different times in different ways, but we're walking with the same God. And as a church, we celebrate that as a spiritual community of called out people responding what God has laid upon our lives. I talked a little bit about George Washington and how the people tried to push him into being a king. He's like, that's not what I want to do. Did you know people tried to push Jesus into being a human earthly king as well? 
People tried to make Jesus an earthly king as well. That story actually comes from John chapter 6, and he had just fed 5,000 people. And guess what? When you give people a whole lot of food to eat from like a couple loaves of bread and a couple little fish, they say, can you do that again tomorrow? (laughs) Can you do that again the next day? And the next day, that'd be great. I don't want to shop anymore. You know how expensive groceries are? Let's just stop shopping, and let's just hope that this guy Jesus keeps feeding us, and we'll follow him, and we'll trust him because he's given us the food that we need. And that same Jesus who gave food, he also healed people that were paralyzed and that were sick, and he even called a dead man out of the grave saying, Lazarus, get up. He's like, that sounds like a pretty good medical care process, right? So anybody gets sick, you just go to your King Jesus, and he'll heal you. He'll heal you of your fever, your strep throat. He'll heal you of your cold or your diabetes or your paralyzed limb. Like, wouldn't that be great? Jesus, how about you be our king? You feed us and you make us feel good and you be our king. Logically makes sense. Jesus says, hold on. (laughs) That's not why I come. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come make him by king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. See, God isn't here just to be your spiritual jukebox. Now, first service, I quickly realized there's some people that know what jukeboxes are. There are some people that are like, what is he talking about, right? See, you used to have to take a coin or a quarter or a penny or a dime, I don't know, and you used to have to put it into a machine and you press a button and it would select a record, the thing that spins around, and it would play that song that you wanted to listen to. You couldn't just stream anything you want whenever you want off of your cellular device. And so sometimes we go to God, we're like, God, if I put a quarter in, you better do what I ask you to do. God, if, if I just say, hey, why don't you do, like, are you going to be my spiritual jukebox? And Jesus is like, that's not why I came. I didn't come to fix your human physical problem. Jesus said, I came to fix your spiritual problem. A spiritual problem is we're all sinners. We're broken. We don't have a relationship with God until we ask God for forgiveness. Until we confess our sin with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God and we're willing to submit our lives to him. Man, when we submit our lives to him, we get the privilege of fixing our eyes on Jesus. The cure for our tendency to seek human saviors is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That comes from Hebrews 12, verse 2. What you say, Jesus, we recognize we're living in a human world, but there's a spiritual influence to this human world. We, we recognize how we raise our kids in this, in this human world, this physical world, is impacted by how we raise them spiritually. We recognize that this book, the Word of God, is a foundation in how we live our lives. There is a spiritual impact to how we live our lives. If our eyes are fixed on God and we say, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How can I live for you? Our lives look very different than if we fix our eyes on other humans and we ask other humans to fix our problems and we're dependent upon them and we fall into all the traps that that produces in our lives. Guys, God wants a relationship with you. He wants to be your king. He wants you to look and follow him and trust him. And listen, you keep his commands and you live out his word and he's like, listen, trust me, follow me. I'll take care of you. Just like he said to Israel. Trust me, follow me. The church gets to be his people following him, representing him, living for him. And God's like, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. Now, you might not be independently wealthy and millionaires and billionaires, but you know what? God is faithful and consistent, and he's always with you, and he gives you a foundation to live your lives on, one that can't be shaken, and you can instruct your kids and be a shining light for them to follow, not a stumbling block to mess them up. Guys, as we move forward in the series, we're going to look back in the Old Testament and we're going to see the character studies and the examples and things that we examine in our lives. Then we're going to look forward and say, okay, because that guy messed up, I don't want to. Or because that person had faith and trust, that's what I want to do. I'm going to model that in my life. We're, We're going to live out these stories in today's world because that's what it looks like to let God shape our lives today. We bow your heads with me. We're just going to close in prayer. And and before I pray, I just want to ask a question that you can reflect on. In what area of your life are you seeking human solutions? You're looking for security, success, or happiness. And you're looking for it from other people instead of turning to God first. Is the Holy Spirit able to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, your eyes and your focus has come off of Jesus and it's, it's going somewhere else and you're getting focused on that and that actually is going to cause spiritual drift to happen in your life. Israel made a, a bad choice in asking for a king and they, they lived in that bad choice for centuries. Maybe there's an area in your life that God wants to set you free from today, a bad choice that he wants you to take your eyes off of him, turn them back to him. Allow the Holy Spirit to to show you maybe what those areas might be. 
to, to help you see that your eyes need to get back on him. You need to start living a life with character and qualities that God will bless. And you want that connection and a relationship with the creator of the universe. Father, we thank you that you pursue us, you come after us, you chase us, you don't want us to drift. And when we ask for help and we, we ask to walk with you, God, you restore, you forgive, you, you make reconciliation happen between a sinful man and a holy, perfect God. Father, this morning I pray there's people that, that recognize the need to see that relationship healed. I pray the Holy Spirit would help them take that step, that they would want to move in that direction. Lord, I, I pray that you would keep us from being blinded by society and norms around us and that your word would show us what your standards are and how you call us to live. Father, thank you for promising to meet us where we're at and to lead us forward from that point. God, as a church, we want to celebrate life change as people get their eyes fixed on you and start living changed lives because the spiritual solutions are what truly fix the human problems that we face. Praise you in Jesus' name.